My subtitle for the article that was published on my town hall extension in Kurish is Building for People, Not for Architects. And that's because I believe that modernist architects build for other architects. They don't build for the general public who lives, works and plays in the public spaces that are surrounded by their buildings. In my view, it's of the utmost importance to consider not only the client who finances the building, but the passerby, the consumer, because everything we build makes up the places in which we all live, and the views of our buildings belong to everyone. This project, as you can see from the plan, is located beside the ruins of a medieval castle in the centre of the village of Kurish, a village situated 15 kilometres or nine miles to the west of Luxembourg City. I was very lucky to be given this project. It had been the object of a competition among, as usual, exclusively modernist architects. The result of the competition was announced just before local elections in Luxembourg. And when a shoebox-like building was declared winner, there was public uproar at the decision. Uproar to the extent that those in power lost the elections to a team that had promised to replace the box with a building that would respect the character of the village. Being the only traditional architect in Luxembourg, I was asked to produce sketches to show how I would approach the design of such a building. The reduced brief was to add more office space and to provide wheelchair and pram access, which wasn't possible in the existing building. This meant replacing the existing structure which linked the historic building to a 1980s postmodern extension. The main difficulty was to provide access to two buildings that had different levels on all but one floor. And the new stair and lift hall had to fit into an irregular corner with limited available space. For the additional offices, we added a two floor extension to the existing annex and filled the articulation space with a new irregular shaped stair and lift hall. It took us a full week to design the staircase, linking all the various levels and access points but at the same time providing an elegant solution. It begins at the lower levels as an oval and winds up to finish as a circle on the top floor to avoid bumping your head against the pitched roof. We also suggested that by adding two or three rows of blocks on top of the existing annex, we could make the attic into a usable space. We also added a cupola as a house for bats, but also to break the line of the roof. Although we were instructed to keep the extension lower than the existing building, we knew that this addition was always going to become the main building and the existing town hall, which was built in the 18th century as an inn, would become the historic annex. We designed the building in a classical vernacular style, using durable materials so that it wouldn't be outdated after 10 or 20 years as so many buildings are today. We were conscious of the fact that although the building should be recognisable as a town hall, it should also have a rural character. The simple architectural language you've used gives to the building the character of a modest town hall, while the more formal solid stone entrance, which was inspired by the town hall in Esternach in the east of Luxembourg along the German border, gives it a public character. In the final stages of the design, we were told to remove the basement where all the technical services were to be housed and to add a visitor's toilet in the entrance hall. This meant moving the lift away from the axis of the building meaning it could be longer housed within the pitched roof. On the one hand, we now had an unwanted volume protruding from the roof, and on the other, we needed to find somewhere to put the technical plant, preferably without reducing the usable space. We had the idea of adding a corner tower element with a pyramidal roof to house both. The tower would accentuate the articulation between the two wings of the building and house the technical plant leaving the external walls free to take full advantage of views and of natural light. As happens very often, the problems thrown at us during the design stage can become the strong points of a composition, provided of course you give enough consideration to them. You know that you've found the right solution when you can no longer see the problem. When we were ready to apply for the building permit, the engineer suddenly refused to take responsibility for the transformation of the 1980s annex and advised the commune to demolish and rebuild. This of course meant a waste of energy and resources. But, as I've come to learn over the years, although an architect has to justify every step of his work, no one challenges the word of an engineer. So demolish and rebuild it was. 
To avoid delays or additional fees, we were told to keep the exact same plan and just adjust the attic floor so that it was on the same level as that of the historic building. I found that clients seemed to feel more comfortable commenting on traditional architecture than on the incomprehensible modernist projects. So my client asked me to remove the pyramidal roof on the tower so as to not compete with the church, to use rectangular windows in the north elevation and to replace the double arch above the entrance door by a single arch. As usual, all of these contributions, positive and less positive, contributed to the form of the design that was finally built. I can honestly say that without the input and changes demanded by the client, this building would be less interesting. So I never shy from clients' comments or desires. Instead of uglifying the face of this Luxembourgish village forever, those who opposed the result of the modernist competition helped preserve its picturesque centre for generations to come. This new building is constructed using natural and solid materials to avoid durability issues associated with synthetic or applied insulations. Over the years, we have developed our own methods of building traditional architecture using the materials readily available on the market. Unfortunately, most building firms are no longer able to build stone rubble walls or vaults, and the current building regulations impose the use of certain systems and materials on everyone. In our system, we started by replacing the traditional 55 cm thick rubble walls with a 49 cm thick single leaf load bearing insulation block. This gives us a wall similar to that of pre-industrial buildings. The stone window frames, sills and cornices can all be incorporated into these walls in the same way as they always were with rubble walls, which you can't do with externally applied insulation systems. Throughout history, the sills and window frames have been used to protect openings in the external walls from the rain and to provide a regular surface against which wooden frames could be placed to install windows. There are several types of insulating blocks available in the market. My preference would be for those made in clay, such as the Poroton blocks made by Wienerberger, which you can see here on the left. I think there's something fundamentally ecological about building your walls using the clay you can dig from the earth below your feet. As today we are generally obliged to use industrially produced materials and to thermally insulate our buildings, this seems a fair trade-off to me. The block we use for this project is Bezotherm, which you can see on the right of the image. It's made of a lightweight concrete block using volcanic aggregate like pumice stone. We prefer to avoid the blocks that incorporate wool or foam insulation, as we don't know how they will perform over time. We always use the classic block with no added insulation. Using these classic blocks you can build up to three floors and satisfy the present A classification demanded for thermal insulation. Above three floors, more resistant blocks are required, and as the resistance of a block increases, its degree of insulation decreases, so additional structural systems or stronger blocks can be required at lower levels. Today, the norm in Luxembourg is that internal floors are made from poured concrete, and roof structures are set on concrete ring beams. So we needed to devise a way of incorporating concrete elements into our masonries without causing cold bridges. For incorporated concrete elements, we have developed a simple system that we derived from the dimensions of German bricks, which are also standard in Luxembourg. A theoretical outside thickness of 11.5 centimetres, which is the width of an insulating brick or lintel, guarantees the continuity of material and facade. This avoids cracking due to the change in materials. 10 centimetres of thermal insulation inside this thickness provides a surface against which any internal concrete element can be poured without creating a thermal bridge and at the same time allowing for micro movements between elements and slab deformation. You can find some of the details we've developed for this type of construction on our website and everyone's welcome to use them freely without asking. The traditional roof trusses which are made from European oak and assembled with traditional details and oak pegs, at least where the engineer would allow us, defines the atmosphere of the room below the roof. The external roof covering is a natural slate with zinc gutters and flashings which are also traditionally used in Luxembourg. 
For the internal finishes, we've used oak parquet for the offices and limestone for the public areas. A healthful environment inside the building is guaranteed by using lime render on the internal walls, finished with water-based mineral paint. People wrongly presume that a traditional building such as this is more expensive or less performant than a modernist equivalent. But despite the use of natural materials such as stone, lime render and oak, this building is less expensive than its modernist counterpart and has the same degree of comfort and performance. To comply with present regulations, we reluctantly had to make the building airtight and provide mechanical ventilation. The ventilation ducts and other technical installations are integrated into the non-structural fabric of the building. The use of false ceilings has been reduced to strict minimum so that those using the building can enjoy a full height between structural floors. This building is also air conditioned and it is all the comforts and services expected in contemporary buildings such as the solar protection you can see here on the image. They are fully integrated in such a way as to make maintenance and replacement easy. In the very substance of the building we have favoured the use of easily recyclable materials. We have provided external masonry and solid insulation blocks, natural wood joinery, roof insulation in rock wool and wood fibre panels, and an interior and exterior wall claddings are in lime render. However, recycling, even cradle to cradle, is no substitute for designing a building that will not need to be recycled, but will stand the acid test of time and remain desirable and usable for centuries to come. The design of traditional or classical buildings involves the layout of simple load-bearing elements using solid materials. It provides a framework within which to design buildings in a simple and logical way. By using traditional architecture, we guarantee the durability of a building as it will never be out of fashion. The best example of a circular economy is knowing how to design and use buildings that last, so they do not need to be dismantled or recycled. Human activity should adapt to the physical conditions provided by existing buildings and not the opposite. Thank you very much for listening.